BBC. Thank you, Prime Minister. The country has been through so much in the last 12 months and so many people today are grappling with everything that's happened. Um, Professor Witte, Sir Patrick, and you, Prime Minister, can I ask if there's one thing you wish you'd done differently in the last year, what would it be? Well, uh, I, I kind of had a feeling you were going to ask something like that, uh, Laura, and you're absolutely right. And I think in, in retrospect, there are, there are probably many things that uh, we wished that we'd known and many things that we wished uh, that uh, we'd done differently at the time in, in retrospect because we were fighting a, a novel uh, disease under very uh, different circumstances, I think, than any uh, previous government had, had imagined. I, I think the, the point I've made to you before, the sing, the, perhaps the single biggest thing uh, that we, uh, the single biggest false assumption uh, that we made was about the potential for asymptomatic transmission, and, and that did govern a lot of policy uh, in the early days, or that misunderstanding about the reality of asymptomatic transmission certainly uh, led to uh, uh, real problems that uh, uh, we, we then uh, really had to work very, very hard to, to, to make up ground. But, uh, you know, we've been learning the, the whole time, and we're continuing to learn. Thank you, Prime Minister. And um, you talked then about learning lessons. Reflecting today, do you wish you had locked down the country much sooner, both in the spring last year and then again in the autumn? And a second, if I may, um, yesterday ITV News uncovered the most shocking and appalling housing conditions in Croydon, which experts have said are the worst they have ever seen. It poses serious questions for the landlord, Croydon Council. But we know that just under half a million people in England are living in substandard social housing. What have you done as Prime Minister to help people living in poor social housing conditions? Well, Dan, first of all, on, on your question about uh, the timing of the decisions that we, uh, that we took, uh, you, these are very, very hard decisions and, and there are no uh, good outcomes uh, either way, as, as, uh, as I think uh, all, all our viewers understand. All these consequences are, are very, very tough. Uh, for people, and uh, uh, all I can say is we took all the decisions uh, with the, uh, the interests of the, of the British people foremost in our hearts and uh, in, in, an, in an effort to protect uh, the public and to prevent death and suffering. That was what we were trying to do at all stages, uh, though doubtless that there will be a moment to properly uh, to review, uh, to learn lessons, and to make sure that we, uh, you know, we learn those lessons, Dan, uh, for future uh, pandemics of, of a kind that I'm sure that there will be. And, Thank you. A question for the Prime Minister and also the government scientists, which actually picks up on Chris Whitty's comments there. We're a year into this pandemic. Should the UK government's policy objective now be to eradicate COVID or simply bring down cases to the lowest possible levels? Well, Ben, I think it's the second uh, in, in the sense that I, I'm not sure listening to the scientists intently as I have uh, for many, many months, I'm not sure that, that, that eradication uh, makes sense in a, in a, in a globalised uh, uh, economy for, for one country alone. Plainly, as, a, as a, an objective for humanity, it's, 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 it's right and, and we, should, we should aim for it. But uh, that's, 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 my, uh, that's, my, that's my view. But, uh, I'm, but I hand to Chris and Patrick. I, mean, I, I, I'm, I, regret, I regret to say that I think the chances of eradicating this disease, which means getting rid of it absolutely everywhere, are as close to zero as makes no difference. We've only achieved eradication of one disease, which is smallpox, with a phenomenally effective vaccine over a very, a very long period of time, literally hundreds of years. So, um, and uh, others have come close, but uh, it's very difficult. In terms of eliminating from the UK, this is a disease which uh, is got most people who have it have mild symptoms, or in some cases, no symptoms, who can then transmit it. That makes it very difficult to find. We have good vaccines, very good vaccines, but they're not 100% effective vaccines. Uh, we have good tests, but not everybody who needs testing uh, is tested and really would strongly encourage people to do that. I think everyone agrees we can get COVID rates right down. That should be absolutely our aim. And to get cases of people who die and have severe disease as close to zero as we can. If we can go further, every, who would say no? But I think if you talk to anybody who looks at this really seriously, who understands how infectious diseases work, I don't think there's anybody who thinks eliminating from the UK or eradicating globally uh, for any long period of time uh, is a realistic uh, prospect at this point in time. I, I agree. I think 
get numbers as low as we can. Don't expect that this is going to disappear. Expect that there will be recurrences of infections, particularly in winter, and uh, this will become a circulating virus as, as others have done over, over thousands of years. And I think this is, this is unfortunately what, what we have. I think the chances of eradication, true eradication, i.e. zero, are in themselves very close to zero, as Chris has said. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Dominic Yateman, Metro. Hi, thank you, Prime Minister. When the time comes, as you put it, to describe this period to future generations, how will we explain why Britain suffered the highest death toll in Europe in the deepest recession? And secondly, if I may, people who own holiday homes overseas, such as your father, for instance, uh, will be exempted from the travel ban affecting everyone else. Would you advise people to buy a second home abroad if they want to have a holiday this year? And a quick one for the scientists, if I may. Uh, are the new variants enough to explain why the second wave killed more people than the first? Uh, Dominic, on your, on your, your overall question about uh, you know, your, your sort of uh, league table question, I, you know, I think I will uh, respectfully uh, go back to the answer that you'll have heard from this uh, podium many times, which is that uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic is, uh, uh, alas, tragically, is, is not over yet uh, across the world. Uh, we mourn the, the loss of every life that's been lost in, in this country, and we're going to continue to uh, protect uh, everyone as, uh, to the best of uh, the best of our ability. But you know, this is this uh, is is not over, and I think that international comparisons uh, are uh, are premature at, the, at, at this stage. And on uh, on your second point, I'm really about uh, global uh, uh, travel uh, and, uh, and and holidays. Uh, a lot of people do want to know about um, uh, what's going to happen on, on, the, on the holiday front. And um, uh, I, I, I know there's a, a great deal of uh, curiosity and interest. Uh, all I can say is it is just too early uh, to say. And so my advice is to everybody to wait uh, for the Global Travel Task Force to uh, report. Uh, we've heard already that uh, there are uh, other European countries where the disease is now rising, so things certainly look difficult uh, for for the time being. Uh, but uh, we'll be we'll be able to say more. Uh, we hope in a, in a few days' time. I, cert I certainly hope to be uh, saying some more by uh, by April the fifth, and and uh, uh, that's uh, I think the best uh, best you can hope for there. In terms of the question you asked uh, uh, us, uh, Patrick may want to add to this, but. Um, you know, it, it's very difficult to be absolutely confident exactly what happened. We're very confident that the majority of people who died in the second half of the second wave, which is by far the bigger one, were from the new variant. So first thing is, that has, dom that has completely has taken over, really, in, in the UK, and that is now the variant. So that is, that is what has driven uh, a lot of these. Now, working out what would have happened had the new variant not arrived is really difficult to do. And I think anyone who claims that they, they, they can with confidence is, is misunderstanding the problem. But uh, the, the, the height of the peak would undoubtedly have been a lot lower had that new much more transmissible and probably more, more, more fatal. But that is more questionable. But the transmissibility, I don't think, is questionable. Uh, had that not arrived, I think the pattern of the second wave in the UK would have been very different. And what you can see when you see what's happening in continental Europe at the moment is the effects of the arrival of the B117 variant uh, is actually causing problems in other countries as it has caused problems uh, now. I share the uh, PM's uh, caution about trying to do international comparisons, although I will make a technical point that if you're going to do it, it's probably best to concentrate on, all, uh, on uh, all excess or cause mortality, just because that's easier to uh, compare between countries. But that's a minor technical point. The general point is we had a bad outcome. Many other countries had a bad outcome. What we want to try and do uh, is to minimise mortality in the future and learn lessons from the past. Nothing to add. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris and Dominic. Uh, Emilio Casalicchio from Politico. Thanks, uh, Prime Minister. Um, I've got a couple of related questions for you and one for the scientists, if that's OK. Um, the EU wants us to share our order of vaccines from a plant in the Netherlands. 
uh, called the Halex Factory, um, and it's been making threats to impose a ban on the jabs coming to Britain if we refuse to share. Um, can you answer yes or no whether we're going to share them, which presumably would help prevent that third wave in the EU from reaching our shores? And the bigger question is, can we afford to share them? Meaning, if we give however many million doses to the EU, will we still have enough to keep our rollout on course? And the question for the scientists are that there are fears that if the EU does place an export ban on some vaccines to the UK, we might retaliate and get into a kind of trade war. Um, some of those fears are coming from Pfizer, which has warned that if we stop sending vaccine components made in Britain to the EU, their production could grind to a halt and presumably that could harm our overall vaccine supplies as well. So do you worry that a tit for chat trade war with the EU could put the, e the UK rollout at any risk at all? Hello, oh, thanks very much, Emilia. Let me go first and say uh, that uh, we're all fighting the same pandemic across the whole of the uh, European continent and indeed around uh, much of the much of the world. And uh, vaccines are, uh, are, are an international uh, operation. They're produced by collaboration between great international uh, scientists. It's a fantastic thing to see how they've uh, been uh, developed, uh, and we'll continue to work with. Uh, uh, European partners to, uh, to, to deliver uh, the vaccine rollout. Uh, all I can say is uh, that we in this country uh, don't believe in, uh, in blockades uh, of any kind uh, of, uh, of, of vaccines or vaccine uh, material, uh, not something that this country would uh, dream of, uh, of engaging in, uh, and I'm uh, encouraged by some of the things I've heard uh, from the continent uh, in the same sense. The only thing I say is, is it's a miracle we've got vaccines. It's been an incredible um, effort by scientists from around the world. We've got companies, academic groups, others who've discovered, produced vaccines right the way around the world. And in a sense, the clue to this is in the title of the problem we've got, which is a pandemic. It affects everywhere. This is something that's only going to be sorted out when everybody is sorted out, and therefore it needs an approach which takes an international approach to how we solve this problem of the of, of, of the virus. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'll just I'll just add to that, and we're all basically saying the same thing, which is uh, every single one of the vaccines we have available depends on science from multiple countries for its intellectual origins, for its immediate recent development, uh, and in almost all cases for its manufacturing distribution. It's absolutely essential. We see this as an international problem, and scientists collaborate the whole time. So Patrick and I talk to our counterparts in. Europe the whole time, scientists up and down the UK, all four nations of the UK are talking to their counterparts in Europe and in every other nation uh, as, uh, as appropriate the whole time. This should be seen as an international issue. And there's no point in one country being immunised on its own. Uh, we need the, the whole uh, planet to, uh, to be inoculated. Thank you all very much. Thank you.